Welcome everybody to the local authority breakout room. Um, here at CT, we work with local authorities on a broad range of housing issues, spanning general fund and HRA activities. We do lots on the consumer standards. We assess compliance. We provide strategic support when things go wrong. We conduct investigations and we help organisations preparing for inspection. Um, we've got two speakers. We've got times, time for Q&A at the end as well. Um, please, can we all be on mute if we're not speaking? Um, and if you have any questions, please do put them in the chat. Um, it's in the chat in the breakout room rather than the Q&A. It's not the purpose of this session to tell you more about consumer standards uh, themselves. You've, you, you have, after all, just heard the headlines from, from Kate and useful insights as well from Richard and your. What we are seeking to do in this session is to share stories of what it's like for a local authority to engage with the regulator. And to that end, we've got speakers from Barnsley and Birmingham. And no, the regulator does not work, work in alphabetical order. The bees are just a coincidence. Um, the regulator has had several practice runs in developing its inspection methodology, where all the uh, participants experiencing ex experience the pilots in a different way. Um, so just out of interest, uh, has anyone here had the call from the regulator that their inspection is in the diary? And if you have, let us know in the chat. Um, both of the organisations speaking have got real world experience of increased levels of regulatory engagement. They've each had ample opportunity to gain an understanding of how the regulator sees the world and of the extent to which the regulator does and does not understand what it is to be a local authority landlord. What we've done is we've asked both speakers to focus on their experience of dealing with the regulator and how those experiences have shaped their approach to con the consumer standards. Um, we can't spotlight speakers in breakout rooms in exactly the same way as we did in the main room. Uh, but we will, at our end, put it on focus mode. So whoever is speaking should be highlighted to all. If it doesn't work for you, you can select speaker in view in the top right hand corner of your screen. That's speaker in view at the top right hand corner of your screen. So first up, we've got Paul Langford, Strategic Director, City Housing, Birmingham City Council. Paul isn't one to blow his own trumpet, but I would definitely blow it on his behalf. If you pay any attention to the, to the local government or housing press, you will know that Birmingham Council has a, um, as a whole has a number of significant challenges and the housing department has its own additional challenges. Paul was brave enough to walk towards these challenges initially as an interim director of housing and then proved his commitment by com competing to be appointed to the job permanently. Um, I can honestly say that the sector needs more people like Paul. Uh, so, Paul, over to you. Thank you, John. <clears throat> I know there's someone in the background there kindly driving. Um, as John did say, I, I did need to be persuaded a little to come in front of you today because, um, you know, the classic phrase here, the first thing I want to say before I delve into the slides is this is definitely the beginning of our journey, it feels like still. We have made some progress over the, over the last six to six to 12 months in different areas. Uh, but this is not Birmingham sat here um, telling everyone how to do it. I'm just going to be as honest as I can about about what's gone on over the last uh, over the last few months, and um, and then hopefully leave plenty of time, John, for for questions and and engagement with uh, with everyone online. So moving forward, let's flip to the next slide. So how did it? Uh, what's the context here? If you could just move the slide on, thank you. Uh, so. The kind of the engagement and the more formal kind of route in to where Birmingham found itself in breach actually started with the ombudsman um, back in, in, in 22, long before I, st I started at the local authority, actually. But that's the history of it. So it came out of complaints. It came out of handling. It came out of a, a lack of empathy, you know, not responding on time. All the all the things that, you know, you see many, many cases, um, you know, over the years. But this for Birmingham was really highlighted you know through the para 49 report that landed and it says january 23 i remember it like it was yesterday i i, I, I think i've been here about six weeks at the time and my local 
Michael Gove actually wrote to us officially on the 27th of December. <laughs> so in between Christmas and New Year, the, the letter lands, and um, and then obviously that gets referred through to the regulator for social housing, etc. So I'm not going to read out all of this slide. You can see it; they can be shared. And our formal monitoring meetings with the regulator begin in July 2023. It feels like we've you know, we've been friends for, you know, about 10 years, but <laughs> but actually it's as, it's as long as that. So our formal monitoring mix has been taking place since then. So on to the next slide. So it, this is the kind of thing that obviously the regulator loves to say. I, you know, I, I didn't listen to all of the speakers this morning, but one of the, the, the last things I heard Kate emphasise was, you know, we will judge on what we see. And we will hear that time and time and time again. And, you know, evidence, evidence, evidence. And and there's two things been going on here um, since April. Um, you'll see some of this work that April last year obviously began before the formal meetings began. Uh, we didn't hang around um, for the for those meetings to begin when you know there's a problem. I'm sure everyone on the line with the GUI, you, you get on with solving the problem as quickly as you can. Um, but... There's two things going on in here in parallel. Um, we are transacting the whole time, so doing more surveys, doing more tests, getting our, our you know our overall compliance position into a much stronger position. But at the same time as transacting, we're assuring. So we're assuring the data. So that's what's happening here in Birmingham. Behind these numbers, lots of independent review and independent support from organisations like Campbell to Kell and Savills that we've lent on throughout the process to give us that independent kind of third party to check against things. So I won't go over the stats, but there's me bearing all. You can see how low some of the percentages were in some of the key areas. I mean, just look at low rise fire risk assessments, you know, 35%, 34.4%. So we've made significant progress in a number of areas and um, we are actually still on course uh, for our own almost self-imposed deadline of, of rectifying compliance across the piece um, by, by June of this year. Assurance will take a little bit longer. So the assurance will then complete uh, in the autumn around September, October time. The investment picture, and I'll come on to that on the next slide if you just move on. Uh, in Birmingham is, is, is you know, what underpins lots of this. So um, you don't get into a position of 40% non-decency overnight, but that's where, where Birmingham is right now. So only 60% of its homes meeting the current standard, never, never mind any of the new aspirations that might come through OAB's law or decent homes too, or anything else that, that comes out, uh, you know, of, of legislation. Um, so, so basically, um, you know, that is the same block. <laughs> I thought a picture tells a thousand, uh, you know, you know, a thousand words really in terms of um, just just sharing one picture with you there. That's the north of the city, um, Hollow Bank Estate. Um, this is the kind of approach that we're taking. So we're not we're not oh, clearly you can see from that we're not purely doing the decency standard. We've got a long term investment plan. It's very much about, you know, a whole asset approach, not all of the assets that we have now. We will have in 10 years time. So we will be disinvesting in a number of areas. But the approach we're taking in Birmingham is we need to do it once and we need to do it well. On to the next slide, please. Nearly done. Here's a graph on complaints because we all love a graph, don't we? Um, I mean, one of the things that we've been trying to do here is maintain our performance on SLA and therefore avoid the ombudsman challenges of the future. I'm sure we're all doing this in our day-to-day -day operations, but also eat into backlogs that stretch back six, seven years, some of the cases. So, you know, we will continue to get, and, th and this is this is one of the, the kind of things that I guess we many of us have the challenge of. We're making progress in one area, but at the same time, there is always the next maladministration or severe mal that you know that we're working through from six, seven years ago uh, that will hit 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 the organisation, hit the press, and knock people back. And that kind of that momentum is a really difficult thing to maintain 
at a time like that. But behind all those numbers, that's the work that's going on. We haven't actually had any maladministration cases cases post action plan. So our Para 49 action plan that was agreed with the Housing Ombudsman has been delivered. And actually, in the last few weeks, we've heard from the Housing Ombudsman that they are stepping back their formal monitoring you know, processes with us, which is a positive step, huge positive step for Birmingham. But we will continue to get maladministration uh, cases popping out whilst ever there's a backlog. And of course, not a criticism at all uh, of Housing Ombudsman colleagues, some of which may be on the line right now, but of course, the housing ombudsmen themselves have backlogs because they are working through, uh, you know, an enormous amount of uh, outstanding compliance, etc. So that's the picture. On to the next slide. Almost done. Some key messages, and I'm not going to read out every single one here. But you know, of course, the regulator is not going to tell you how to solve the problems, and hopefully, you know. We all have enough experience and, and knowledge within our, our, our local teams and our organisations to, you know, to be able to solve the issues in front of us. But the importance of a strong leadership team, you know, it's just an obvious thing to say. Really, I just can't emphasise. You know, I've done, I have had to in Birmingham, um, you know, recruit in and, and and get in the very the very best and and very experienced people to kind of meet some of the challenges. Um, you know, what's Boy, with all the stats, you know, we have 60,000 homes, largest local authority landlord, you know, I think in Europe. Um, so, you know, we, we are a huge organisation. We need people in the organisation that have been there, done it, and, and have a proven track record, you know, but that needs to flow right through. And that that need for skills and expertise across the sector and it is, a, is a real challenge for us all. Um, and, and one that, you know, one that I think it will con continue to be um, a challenge in moving forward. I, th I think, you know, there, there was obviously a keen focus on the data. I've, I've actually put, just put one slide up there, but I cannot tell you in those first few months of engagement how many requests there were <laughs> for, for additional information from the regulator around the issues that obviously we were facing. They were, you know, coming in in their droves. So just controlling that data flow in a, in a manageable way, in a sensible way, is really important and of course when you when you receive a breach and and this was the first time I, i'd had the joy and the experience of it as a director but when you do there are specific things on that breach and you, you the focus is there but quite often that can spread into other areas of the of the organization in terms of some of the questions that are being asked my advice would be yes be open try and stay focused on the breach and focused on the matters around the breach and i'm sure if john was talking um you know in a few minutes he would confirm that that would be the advice of, of organizations like camp to kill but by the same token you know where there's a need to kind of evidence things in the wider strategic sense sometimes you can't it's the world's just not that perfect it's not that straightforward and you need to be pragmatic um so that would be my point on there. Um, cleansing and understanding and assurance is, is, is so important. You know, um, I've mentioned that already. On to the next slide. And I think that's the final slide, the next one. So in terms of preparation, you know, that's probably what you've heard this morning. You know, we've done our self-assessments. I'm sure, you know, our initial pass at that. We've put in place very strong governance arrangements, you know, Throughout the context the council's working in, governance is very, very important. Um, one of the things that, <laughs> let's look at the cloud and every silver lining, right? Every cloud and all that. Um, I suppose bearing in mind the timing of our intervention, it, it put housing a little bit ahead of some of the, the other parts of the organisation uh, in Birmingham in terms of, you know, governance and the need to ensure that we've we've got compliance in place. And, you know, all of that was really honed and really clear. Um, so I think there's been some advantages there. And in fact, the overall council IRP, because of the overall intervention, it, it, this is basically a subset for housing. You know, there are some other things that are included in that, but our contribution towards the council's moving the council moving forward and and um, pro progressing in, in that way, you know, through the IRP was written in a sense via via uh, via the work that we've done here. 
Um, we do have other, as I'm sure other local authorities will have as well, other parts of that governance in terms of member interfaces and, and uh, you know, cross-party interfaces and scrutiny and the rest. Um, you know, the, the last point I say is that obviously there has been learning on both sides. You know, I, th I think the regulator would confess that. You know, we have developed a positive, constructive relationship with the regulator. I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to say... You know, it's all lovely and fluffy and <laughs> the birds sing and the sun comes out every time that we meet together. Um, but those formal meetings are are constructive. Um, they're challenging. You know, we had one this week. Uh, they come around really quickly. Every four weeks and every four weeks, you know, you're in the headmaster's office trying to show that you've, you've made progress and, and you've maintained. So it, it can be exhausting at times. So momentum is, is really important to maintain. But I would say we have that constructive dialogue um, and there has been some leaning on both sides because the system, of course, wasn't designed initially for local authorities and, and some of those differences between RP colleagues and local authorities have become evident in the, in the first few weeks of engagement, really. I'm going to stop there. Um, hopefully that's more or less on time, um, but um, hopefully there'll be, there'll be time for discussion and, and questions at the end. Thank you, John. Thank you, Paul. Absolutely excellent. I think just what we needed to hear. Um, I think a, a couple of observations from me. Um, the first is how similar your lived experience of being under increased regulatory engagement, how similar that is to Kate Dodsworth's brochure as to what that should feel like. You know, it, it's the same. that they're... they're, they're their focus on data, um, uh, their focus on governance and assurance, all of those things, they enact what they say they are going to do. Um, and I think that there's, you know, there's comfort to be taken from that for organisations who need to be getting ready for it. Um, and I, and the other th my other observation is... Um, the differences from RP governance and uh, and how that... Because in RP land, there is a board solely focused on the housing service. You know, you've got eight, nine, 12 people sat around a table solely focused on the housing service. And in local authorities, it's governance is simply different. And it's going to take the regulator a little while to get their head around that. Um, and it's going to behove, I think, all local authorities to be able to explain, you know, there needs to be a sort of an elevator pitch that you could explain in 30 seconds as to how you achieve appropriate governance input and how you approach assurance, because they are two things that are of great interest to the regulator. Um, yeah. But absolutely fantastic, Paul. Thank you very much for that. Um, next up. We've got Cathy McArdle, Service Director, Regeneration and Culture, and Sarah Cartwright, Head of Strategic Housing from Barnsley. Now, Barnsley's got an Elmo, Burns Lie Homes. As with all Elmos, the council remains the landlord. Um, the Elmo is a managing agent, and it's the landlord who is regulated by the Regulator for Social Housing. It's fair to say that proactive regulation of the new consumer standards requires a turbocharging of council almo clienting relationships. Um, Barnsley learnt about the implications of all this following a serious incident uh, in an Almo property. I've worked with Cathy and Sarah on a comprehensive investigation of the lessons to be learned from the incident. So I know that they are uh, a reminder of what clever and committed looks like in local government. So Cathy and Sarah, over to you. Brilliant. I think we're going to um, take up the slides. If we could jump to the second slide. Um, John has covered some of what's on the second slide already about the relationship between Barnsley Council and the Almo and uh, Burnsley Homes, who manage the council owned housing stock and manage our relationship with tenants. In that relationship, the council has retained some functions. So, for example, we still retain management of the HRA um, housing options. 
we deliver the call centre on behalf of Burnsley Homes through a reciprocal services level agreement. And we also manage neighbourhood services and significant ASB, which is escalated up to the council as well as the IT functions. Um, so, so that's the kind of core of the relationship and the split functions. You'll see on there the value of the HRA, which stands at 85 million, and the annual management fee to Burnsley Homes is 15 million pounds. But in against the background of, of, of changing regulation in 2021, in the summer of 21, we commissioned a review of the Almo clienting relationship. Um, partly because we wanted to really understand how we could manage that contract more effectively and how we could be a smart and intelligent client asking the right questions um, of our Almo as our managing agent to get the assurance we needed that our services were being delivered effectively for residents. So following that review, we put in place a, a robust assurance framework which is supported by a small clienting team. And that robust assurance framework consists of a whole range of a suite of KPIs, a set of regular assurance meetings, planning sessions, which are co-developed and co-designed, um, and, and a whole range of workshops with the Almo. And you'll see that the clienting assurance structure consists of our chief executive of the council who is designated principal accountable person then myself as accountable or responsible person for the council. Um, but I also sit as shareholder representative um, on the Burnsley Homes Board alongside two of our nominated councillors. And also as and then I'm I've fulfilled the function of lead clienting officer. But clearly I'm supported in that by Sarah Clyde, our head of strategic housing, who manages the day-to-day -day clienting relationship. And the whole purpose of this is to make sure that, you know, the work of Burnsley Homes, its strategic plan and its business plan are aligned to the council's objectives um, that were engaged in joint planning, that they're managing our assets and our housing stock and the repairs and maintenance function really effectively, as well as our tenant engagement. Um, and that we are a proactive, intelligent client in that relationship. So I'm going to hand over to Sarah. I'll take you through the next slide and I suppose share with you a recent experience of engaging with the regulator on the incident that John mentioned and what our learning was from that engagement with the regulator. So over to you, Sarah. Thanks, Cathy. Um, in terms of our recent engagement, um, as, as John alluded to earlier, we did make a self-referral in June 2021 uh, to the regulator, which only concluded uh, in September last year uh, with a, a no breach in terms of the consumer standards. However, the incident itself resulted in an initial police inquiry and coronary inquest, uh, which delayed and protruded um, our involvement and engagement with the regulator of social housing in terms of their investigation. We were keen for all the matters to be concluded before the regulator undertook their investigation and they were very supportive of that, uh, that process. So it was really important for us, given that our Alma had been heavily involved in the investigation from a police and coroner's perspective, that we wanted to set out with the regulator um, and clarify uh, the Alma arrangement that we'd got in place and our role as landlord and how seriously we took that role. Um, so the council... Uh, was the only uh, direct contract through uh, contact throughout um, setting the relationship as our accountable person and landlord with the regulator. We felt that was important. Um, some of our uh, SMT members in the Almo had uh, come from a housing association background. And obviously, as, as we've all spoken about, there's very different relationship and governance arrangements between housing associations and local authorities. And we've absolutely followed that through throughout the whole process. Um, I took a lead liaison role, but we ensured that we included uh, representatives and the right level of seniority from the council uh, in our meetings to show uh, the seriousness of, of, of the incident and how we wanted to work collaboratively with the regulator. Um, overall, I can't say it wasn't a positive experience, and I'm not just saying that because we didn't have a breach in the consumer standards. It was really positive and it's led us um, you know, to be um, on the front foot, really, in terms of preparing for regulation. The regulator was very forensic, very sustained. They asked the right questions. They were fair, but they wanted evidence, as Kate alluded to earlier. Uh, and they focused on the consumer themes around repairs, safety, and considered vulnerabilities in dealing with the individuals around the matter itself. They didn't give anything away, 
They didn't let us know how we were getting on. They didn't give us any right answers. Um, and it was really uh, that co-regulatory approach and give us, a, give us the evidence to support how you're saying you're, you're dealing with things. Um, so we did give them a lot of information. Data was absolutely king. And again, that's followed through in our assurance frame and work to ensure that because we're that one step removed as an ALMO, we really need to have the um, the assurance that our data on our assets and our people is is robust. In terms of learnings, um, streamlining that involvement and having the landlord only involved enabled us to give that uh, one consistent message to the regulator in terms of where we were as an authority and the evidence we were able to provide. Record keeping, luckily, uh, we were able to provide really detailed timelines, uh, briefings in advance of sessions. Uh, we provided what we were asked for rather than bombarding, but we were also able to give that wider strategic alignment, which if our ALMA had led on it, I don't think they would have been able to do so as well. Um, it highlighted uh, the importance of the insurer framework that, that we'd got in place and the requirement to strengthen that. And we rolled that into the response to regulation. Next step, slide, please. Um, the Aram client in review that Cathy alluded to set us on the right path in terms of governance, framework and strategic alignment. And as things have continued to come out around the Social Housing Regulation Act, preparation for our law, etc., it's assisted us to get on the front foot there. But the regulatory investigation brought our accountability to life. It really showed our senior management team, our members, the leader of our council, that we as landlord were accountable for these consumer standards. Um, and it woke people up in terms of the importance of housing. Um, as John said, you know, it's not the only thing in town that a local authority does, uh, but it really put the emphasis on that. It's been really key for us to work collaboratively as one council, because as Cathy says, we've got services that are delivered by our ALMO, but we've also got services delivered by the council that contribute to the wider tenant satisfaction measures and the services to our tenants. Um, so it's been, we've been really um, keen to ensure that everybody's roles and responsibilities are clear. We've done members, all members briefings with our members to make them aware of the regulatory changes and their roles and responsibilities. Communication plans in terms of preparing for inspection, who's going to be involved and what that should look like. Um, governance was absolutely crucial, ensuring that we've got a really robust building and fire safety governance arrangement. And we've got a joint regulation oversight board, um, which is a collaboration between the council, our ALMO and our tenant voice panel as well. And we're putting at the heart of everything. Um, we've done a gap analysis ourselves as the council uh, because we think it's important that while we're still working collaboratively, ultimately as landlord, we need to ensure that we've got that assurance in place and that we're identified those gaps that we want the ALMO to work on. Um, and also we focused particularly on implementing a number of key things around our lettings, policy refresh, new repairs first systems to ensure that we've got the right asset information and the right information on our tenants as well. I'm not saying we're perfect. If somebody comes next week and says we're going to have an investigation, we're going to be as worried as everybody else. But we feel like we've had a strengthened uh, relationship with both the regulator and the ALMO as a result of going through that um, the regulatory process. Council and our members are clear on the regulatory requirements, the implications and our accountability. Uh, and I think it's been really helpful that we've developed that positive um, relationship with the regulator in advance of moving into this new regulatory regime. Thank you. And just to close, you know, one of the things that we're aiming to work on is is to ensure that both Barnsley Council's governance and Barnsley Homes governance all are cited on the work that we're doing and that we all speak with one voice and we have a shared narrative and a shared understanding of the kind of strengths and weaknesses in our current management of our housing stock. Um, but obviously events like this and webinars like this are really crucial because you know we've already picked up quite a lot of things and areas that we want to address going forward as well. So very, very grateful, John and the team at Campbell to Cal for, for giving us a chance to participate in this webinar. You are very, very welcome. Um, so I've got uh, uh, bad news and good news. Um, the, the bad news is they're going to close the breakout room in two minutes. Um, the good news is nobody's actually put any questions in the chat. So um, we're not going to run out of time for those questions. But I'll, I'll just make some a, a few closing observations, if I may. Um, uh, I said this in a, to, to, to Cathy and Sarah yesterday, and I think it's as true in Birmingham as it is in, in Barnsley. Ironically, because of the challenges, the service challenges that those organisations have had, they've actually got a head start on what it is to be regulated um, because they've gained that insight via increased levels of regulatory engagement. Um, and you can hear that in what both of them have got to say. 
Um, and then the other observation is just that um, it was two choirs singing slightly different versions of the same song. So the message from Birmingham and Barnsley, they're the, it's the same set of messages put slightly differently. And that's um, uh, reassuring because it means that there's a commonality that, that others can, can learn from. Um, so a couple of final thoughts from me, just as the, we close the room. First, you can find out more about how CT can help you with consumer regulation on our website. Um, and secondly, if you already know what that you need to know more, we'll be providing a link after the event that will enable you to directly book a 30 minute discussion. So just remains for me to say thank you very much to our speakers. Um, I thought that was really interesting. Lots of common ground. Um, and with that, we'll sit tight and sit on our magic carpets again and go back to the main room.